The Digital Photography Cafe Show is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe Show. Join hosts Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina as they serve up the hottest photography news and commentary. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is episode 157. I'm Joseph Christina here with my co-host Trevor Curran. On last week's episode, we talked about Google Satellite Internet, Canon Cloud Storage, and Samsung ditching the DSLR. If you haven't watched last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it at digitalphotographycafe.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. Listen with the popular Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox music apps, or subscribe through iTunes or RSS. Hey, Joe, we're back. How you doing? Good. Not bad at all. Another week. Yeah, another week. <laughs> Some crazy stuff going on here in uh, my office this week. Having yeah, all kinds your... of power problems and stuff. Ah, it's driving me crazy. I oh, know. Had to pull out all these battery backups that I have, and I don't know whether I've got brownouts going on or what, but... All I know is it's uh, really causing some problems. I got to get this fixed. Yeah, no, we're late to do the show a day because we're kind of getting stuff together. You also have a um, a new family member, right? Yeah, just finally, just... guys. I broke down and bought a new computer, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm finally uh, going to retire the 2006 Mac Pro that I've been using all this time, and I bought a brand new um, MacBook Pro. The uh, 15 inch um, 512 um, gig flash storage, 16 gigs of RAM. I mean, it's it's a good machine. Um, yeah. And for what I'm doing now, um, will be more than powerful enough. Yeah. Um, it's I, you know, honestly, even what I was doing before, you know, with you know the crazy Photoshop files and stuff like that, and all the intense Illustrator work. I mean, this machine would still be fine. Um, sure. This is light years ahead of where my 2006 Mac Pro was. Oh, so, yeah, uh, absolutely. And th then again, look, you spent about as much as I would pay for a used car for my daughter. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. When all said yeah. and done, we're like twenty nine hundred bucks. You know, I, yeah. I bought a keyboard. I had to buy a um, a Thunderbolt to gigabit gigabit Ethernet adapter so yeah. I could plug into my wired network here in the office. Um, so yeah, I mean, it all adds up. It all yeah, adds up. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the little one. Yeah. That's uh, yep. fantastic. We'll be, we'll it's always be, great. We'll be building her out over the next week and get everything up yeah. and running so I can, you know, officially retire the 2006. So yeah, it's always fun getting a new machine and everything is running like light speed and not yeah. just kind of meandering around. So that's <laughs> great. Anyways, we need to get right into it. We got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, Adobe did their thing. Uh, this week, so we need to talk about that, right? Yeah, they had their big uh, keynote for the Adobe Creative Cloud 2014. And, uh, you know, they, they were kind of, you know, putting out there what's old is new again and, you know, what's <laughs> new is new again. I, I don't know, yeah, something, I don't something know. like that. Something. And uh, But they really did um, make a lot of improvements and updates to the Creative Cloud suite of applications. Yeah, that was like one of the longest keynotes I think I've ever heard. It yeah. was just forever. I know. I think it was forever. like two hours long. I don't know. They did a lot of demos and stuff, which, you know, actually was good. Um, it really, you know, the, the key features in all these different apps, um, you know, they really did need to demo it to get excited about it because otherwise, yeah. you know, what's the big deal, right? You know, why would you even care? So, so uh, yeah, I mean, overall, they, they did a lot of stuff that I'm personally interested in, like with illustrator and more from the design end um but as far as the photography end goes um they had some really interesting updates you know updates to photoshop and the mobile apps which yeah uh, were pretty good yeah no absolutely i i do i know something that you can speak on is the font library and you just had a uh, whenever we do do any type of illustrator work or if you're doing photoshop and you're adding text to it and you have this ton of of uh, fonts and you're trying to figure out what font to go through and we all know we've all done this and you're, you're going through them and you're taking a look and then you're yeah. going to the next one you take a look you go to the next one you take a look um, that's a problem but what's also problematic is if you have this font 
and it's on a different machine or whatnot. And yeah. now you just load that that image, that Illustrator image or Photoshop image into the another machine and it says, what does it come up with? Well, guess what? Your font is missing. Yeah. Do you want me to replace it with like Arial or something? It's right. like, no, please don't right. do that. <laughs> just hold on. Let me go and find it. So it's always been, fonts have always been a hassle right throughout the years. Well, it looks like Adobe has kind of fixed that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, this really has been a problem. Um, I know in the past we used to use a program called Suitcase, which yeah. was a font management program, um, and it worked well, but it really worked better in the older versions of, you know, 10 and then, you know, 9 and 8 and, and below. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, once you started getting into the higher versions of 10, Suitcase just really was becoming, you know, not as effective. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were actually just ditching suitcase and using the built-in font book to manage their fonts. The problem with that, though, is you have to load everything in there. Um, you know, you open up a file in Photoshop and you know that the fonts are loaded in font book. Then all of a sudden you get an error, fonts are missing. You close the, the file, you open it again, and then miraculously they're, they're there again. Um, it's kind of cumbersome. It's kind of a pain. But with this new um, type kit, which has all their fonts... Um, and being linked to the internet when you need a font, all you have to do is click on it and it instantly loads it. Yeah. And yeah. now you can actually hover over the font name and see it change in your document. So if you're working in Photoshop, you put a headline on a, on a file, you know, like Joe was saying, you, you would have to go into the type palette, select a font, let it change. Nah, I don't like that one. Select another font, let it change. Now all you have to do is hover over the font and it changes yeah. on the fly, which yeah, is so big. much faster. Yeah, that's that's major, especially if you do any type of uh, work with fonts, as we do, continuously making ads or whatever we're doing. Fonts right. are a very big, big thing. And to be able to manipulate them, move them around, um, cross-platform, cross-machine, uh, anything when you're dealing with fonts that are kind of moving. Um, and that's one of the things that they were talking about with CC and what how great CC is, is right. basically you put your fonts up into the cloud and now every machine that's yep. running CC has those fonts. So you never are getting that message that says, hey, your font's missing. What and, do you want me to do? And you know? the other so. thing that I like about this and that I would encourage designers and photographers to do is if at all you can use the fonts in Typekit and there's thousands of them there. Yeah. So I'm pretty much guarantee you, you can find a font you'll like in, in there for a project you're working on. You're better off using these fonts as opposed to something you download from the internet or from a third party font developer. The reason Absolutely. being is everybody moving forward, like it or not, is going to end up having to use Creative Cloud. Any professional agency or studio that's bigger, that has a number of people, you know, that needs to be compatible, they're going to be on Creative Cloud. Everybody exactly. is going to have access to Typekit. All the fonts are going to be just a click away. If you're using a specialty font, you have to be very, you know, understanding of the license of that font if you right. were to send it outside to a service bureau or to another agency. Yeah. Your license may not allow for that. So you may need to convert all your fonts to outlines or something exactly. like that, or like in Photoshop, rasterize all your fonts. Exactly. Um, and that becomes a hassle as well. So I've just got like you a whole said, you know, just like you said about converting to outline, even if like many times we do not use fonts out of the box because we want to give them a little bit of flair because a right. font is as important sometimes as the picture, as the illustration, the, the, the font really tells the story. Right. So many times we're taking a font and then manipulating it, turning into lines and then going and pulling and yep, pushing sure. and, and changing the shape of the font. But the point that, that Trevor's making here is start with a font that's easy to get. Start with an yeah. Adobe font and then do your um, manipulation. So this way, at least you know your base is still there and that's all you're doing is you're adding in the recipe um, to go and make those changes to the exact font that you want. Um, it, it just makes things easier. And definitely when it comes to rights, it's a hard thing. Fonts are, are kind of crazy. And what you think is royalty free ends up not being royalty free. Right. It ends up, you know, you have to do this X or Y or Z, or you can't do this and can't do that. I wouldn't go through all that. I agree. Stick with Adobe's fonts. I mean, you could make yeah. your manipulations after the fact through line and you know, everyone's happy. Yeah, I mean, a couple other features in the new version of Photoshop that are worth mentioning is they, they have what's called smart guides. 
So if you're doing a, a composition and you're laying out multiple images, let's say, and you want them spaced evenly apart, mm -hmm. as you slide the next image into a position, these smart guides will pop up on screen and actually show you measurement increments and will actually lock in yeah. um, to position when you get to like a certain point. So it's great yeah. for distributing um, multiple elements evenly across the, the, the width or the height of a page. Um, exactly. That's really cool. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's like uh, just snap guides like yep. we've had for years, but on crack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just yeah, does, it, it kind of takes it's it to the easier, next level. It's easier, cleaner. Yeah. Yeah, and it has all the measurements there for you. As many times you're looking at it, and you're like, I don't, is that right? And you're zooming in to try to get the really the you're moving your the, rulers around and trying to get it exactly. down to the pixel or whatever. Yeah, it's it's kind of a pain. This would this definitely makes it a lot easier for actually doing layouts, um, which is great for me especially. So oh, yeah, okay. moving on. They've they really talked a lot about mobile stuff, right? And using Lightroom on the iPad and how they and how this all like kind of comes together in CC and how you can do manipulations here and then you see them there and moving pictures from um, side to side and from platform to platform, which is kind of interesting, right? Right. Yeah, well now Lightroom Mobile, I mean, that's been available for the iPad for a little while now. Yeah. Um, now it's available on the iPhone. Yeah. And what they're doing is, with Lightroom Mobile is they're making it all um, seamless between yeah. the iPhone, between the iPad and the desktop. Now you're going to be able to sync in the cloud. You can um, check the collections of images that you want to sync. You know, that way you don't have to sync everything. Um, and through the cloud interface, you know, it will move an image from, let's say, your iPhone that you took into a mobile collection that you have. And right. that mobile collection is synced with your desktop and with your iPad. You can do edits in any of the three platforms, and it syncs back. Um, right. It really looks cool. Um, yeah, I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the whole edits. Obviously, it's not really editing the photo. It's editing a small little sidecar um, right. file, right. which is makes it very simple. Yeah, it's so all non-destructive stuff. Right. So everything has access to that sidecar, so all the manipulations are set in there, right. which is great. But what I like about this is what's really neat is taking your iPad, let's say, um, you have your collection of a shoot that you just did of some headshots. You sit on the couch with a client and you have them just swipe through and put star ratings yep. on the ones that they like, so one star. Then you go through them again, let them put two stars and then maybe three stars for their final selection of the two or three that you're gonna be um, retouching for them. Simple, it's a lot better than yep. your clients, you know, hanging over your shoulder. Breathing um, down your neck, yeah, that, exactly. Breathing down your neck, looking on the, the back of your 27 inch, you know, computer or whatnot they're sitting comfortably in a nice leather couch right with this beautiful ipad because to me that's what it's made for I mean, oh the, yeah the colors are very the integrity is great the the images come out absolutely stellar and um they can make their selections there just relaxing and those selections end up on your computer too so that that right. is just it's really that that works really well for me right and the star ratings that you mentioned are now available on lightroom mobile before right. they weren't, a lot of people were like, really? I mean, star yeah, ratings like, are, what is that? are like one of the key features that you need when doing your selects and they're not available. You know, yeah. what's that all about? So now they are available. You can rate them, you know, one to five like you can on the desktop. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's really neat. I mean, you can do some basic editing with the mobile apps, um, but you're not going to do any intense stuff. Um, like you said, Joe, I think really the best usage for the mobile versions are syncing. So you have all your images together when you need them, but also doing your selects, doing your ratings, letting your client go through them. Or even for you, I mean, if you want to, you don't want the laptop sitting on you, you know, you want to go in into the house and the comfort of your couch, maybe while you're watching TV with the family. Now you can grab your iPad, go through, do all your selects. And by the time you go into the studio the next day, everything will be done and ready for you to start editing. Yeah, I mean, I can I can tell you for sure. Um, selects are just for me the absolute worst thing ever uh, known I to me. I cannot stand it. I really can't. Especially I after some you've shot are, like a thousand photos or something. Exactly, right? and it it is the most boring tedium. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just I, it makes me nuts. So 
just to be able to do that and relax and just do it, like you said, from the couch and just hanging out and just slowly getting it done in comparison to sitting in front of the monitor right. and going through them. Because after a while, it gets to be just too much. And over the years, I've like probably 1.5 million pictures um, now in digital. That doesn't include all my film right. that, that are in the can. So you can imagine all those selects that I've done. That's why my eyes, I think, are going. But um, yeah, it's just... It's, it's rough, but yeah, this will definitely, it, it makes it easier. That's simply right. it. Instead of si having to sit um, in front, you know, in front of the computer on your desk, you can do it from comfort anywhere. And what's kind of neat is I could actually do those selects if I wanted to from Panera or Starbucks. Absolutely. As long right? as you have an internet connection. Yeah, exactly. So that is huge. That is really, really something big. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's very cool. So the yep. other photography mobile app that they introduced is called Photoshop Mix, and this is yeah. for your iPad. It's not yet available on the iPhone. Right. Um, and this is this is really kind of cool. It's kind of like a a very limited Photoshop um, slash Lightroom. I mean, it allows you to do some edits, some basic stuff, but again, it's got the synchronization, so you can grab a photo from the device itself. So if you took a picture with your iPad, you can grab a photo from there. You can get it from Creative Cloud. You can get it from Facebook. You can get it from your Lightroom mobile libraries. Um, you can grab your photos in there and then basically do simple, non-destructive enhancements to it. Exactly. Um, which is great. And then yeah. uh, now they have uh, um, a feature called Looks. And mm -hmm. Looks is kind of what you see in a lot of iOS apps. So you throw a... You select a filter and it gives you different variations of that filter. Yeah. So then you can kind of select the one you want. Same type of thing. You can kind of select a preset, let's say, and then they will show you variations. You can select one of those variations as your starting point, which yeah. is which is kind of nice. I wouldn't. I would say this is this is definitely not. I don't think it's a pro tool. No. Um, no it no. does have you know it it does have some things that you can do with it that's kind of neat. But yeah, it's. It's very, uh, I would say it's not deep at all. It does have content to wear fill, which is ridiculous <laughs> on your iPad, but it's kind of cool um, that it can even do that. Shake reduction, uh, you know, all kinds of like distortions and, well, and but, whatnot. Yeah, but what's interesting with those, and this is where the technology in Creative Cloud is coming into play. So the upright filter, shake reduction, and content aware fill are all done on the server side. Right. So you will go in and say, you, you know, they gave an example of a building that's a little crooked. So they go in, they, they select the upright, they select the building, they, it, and it gets sent up to the cloud. The cloud processes it and then sends it back to your iPad you know, in just a few seconds. Yeah, so it's almost like they're using the consumer base as a testing grounds for this, guys. It's kind of, yeah. kind of neat because what could happen here in the future is our machines will not need to do as much as they used to right all of that load can be offset to yep. these huge huge server um sites where they just have just massive amounts of data crunching that can go on there sure. so you send up your your image that you want to do content to wear fill um for or some type of pulling or manipulation that takes a lot of processes to get done right that now you can do it on a dumb terminal and not even have That's a right. machine that that can actually do that process because the process is done in the cloud. It's I can see that they're moving towards this and they're using this kind of like a little uh, you know shake and bake area um, to see how it you know to see how, how it ends up how well it yeah, works yeah how it ends up tasting once it comes out of the oven. I I can see this being down the future the way that um, they try to go with it where all that manipulation all that hard crunching mathematics yep. are done in the cloud the problem problem with this is, Trev, and I know we've talked about this in the past, is the upload speed of your computer or of your okay. network. Yeah. If you have a fast download speed, that's fine, guys. You can watch movies and all the rest of the stuff. But if you're trying to crunch on a 16 um, uh, you know, meg JPEG that has to go back and forth up into the cloud, right. um, that's a lot. That, that's going to take is a, a lot. lot of time. And it, now all of a sudden it's the prohibitive. So yeah. a lot of this is going to, I think, really um, kind of uh, hinge on the speed of the Internet. And they're, I guess they're betting on it getting faster. 
Well, and, and it do. appears that they're doing a lot more with the non-destructive edits. So right. more and more of these edits are basically becoming sidecar data, you yeah. know, just as in Lightroom and and within Photoshop with your with your adjustment layers and such. So yeah, I mean, if it's a matter of sending the image up there so they have the hard data and then they go and manipulate it and basically can send back sidecar data, you know, sending that sidecar data back is, is the There's easy nothing. part. It's exactly. getting that original image up there. It, that's, that's the, the problem. problem. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see where it's going to go. Um, right. So anyways, prices. Right, yeah. price nine ninety nine. They finally decided nine ninety nine is the magic number. We've said that for a long time. Yeah, they this is for out Lightroom, 20. Photoshop, exactly. Creative they, Cloud combo, exactly. Yeah. So not too bad. The price is right. I think it's funny they went from twenty gig uh, in their original promo that they gave us as uh, the amount of um, data in the cloud that we can use. Now all of a sudden that turned to two. Yeah. Um, it's a yeah. little bit of a difference from 20 to 2. But I guess like uh, we were talking about earlier, it's more, it, it, they don't really want you to use creative, uh, the, the CC, the whole cloud service as a place for you to put your pictures. They really want you to put your fonts up there, to put your, uh, any type of small assets, your changes, your change the, the files. The sidecar data and stuff. Sidecar yeah. data, this type of yeah. thing. They don't really want your quote unquote photos or data that obviously if you went from 20 gigs to two gigs so. and if you if you want to put your photos up there they're happy to take them but you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna pay a lot for them fork it over fork man. it over fork that it over. and that that 9.99 a month now goes up to 19.99 a month or yeah. 29.99 a month and at that point you get to price breaks saying well all right, maybe it's better that I just get the full creative suite and have more storage. And, yeah, forget know. it. I'm just going to go $100 a month. Here you go, Adobe. Yeah, we're, we're good. We're we'll good. just get everything. 1200 yeah, a year, no problem. Yeah, why not? So, all right, guys, we have a lot more for you, but uh, let's go ahead and take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors. Are you frustrated with slightly out-of-focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer, and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. All right, we are back. So more Adobe. We can't, you know, get through... <laughs> <laughs> through an entire show with only one Adobe segment. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Lightroom 5.5 came out this week, right, Joe? And you downloaded that and installed it and was checking out a couple things, reading the uh, release notes on it and everything. So, uh, yeah, you know, big yeah, download, so it just, right? Uh, yeah, it was a big one. So it was 520 meg or somewhere around there, download. It installed at about 1.2 gig. Um, it's big. It's yeah, big. They it's keep big. getting bigger and bigger. I remember the first Lightroom one, two, whatever it was. Uh, it, it just it was tiny, you know, compared to this. Yeah, two hundred. Um, it's probably a, yeah. Again, I don't know about that, but it was <laughs> it was definitely a lot smaller than than the one point two gig. But regardless, so it's installed. We have it in there, and um, kind of looking through it. They did add. Uh, they just like they always do. They add cameras. Um, that's like their major thing is adding cameras. So, um, all the major brands are kind of in there. So you got Canon, Fuji, Nikon, Olympus, Panasonic, Pentax, Samsung, as well as Sony. So they, a lot of the new cameras that you'll see that hit the market there, of course, now all of their raw files are being able to be Gotta read be supported. Yeah, exactly. By the brand new Lightroom 5.5. Now that's not CC guys, that is Lightroom 5.5 because we are not on CC in the studio as of yet. Right. Um, so we just went from Lightroom 5.4 and I think it released 5.5 like two days ago, three days ago. So we installed that and so far everything's good. They did do some modifications um, and some updates. For example, tethering. There's a lot of Nikon guys out there. We've talked about the D600 and D610. Well, the D610 now um, can tether. You can tether using 
uh, Lightroom, which is really cool. And if you're right, in a sure. studio, that's a really big thing. Let's say you're shooting a product shot, you can tether, you can go ahead and do different types of focusing to it and um, look at what you're getting, what you see is what you get kind of thing on your screen, on your big monster monitor in comparison to looking into the back of the camera. So that works out really good for product photography. It also works very good for model shoots. Oh, yeah. You take a couple of pictures, um, they pop up either on your monitor or maybe you sync them to a big plasma or a big um, LCD hanging on the screen, uh, on, on the wall, and they can go and look and see how things are going. That works out really well also. So you got the Nikon, the DF, uh, the D610 and the D5300. I know the 5300 is big. And also, finally, the Canon T5. Um, all four of those now can tether directly into Lightroom 5.5. So that's a lot. I mean, that's that's good. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's know? good. So, and they had a, a number of bug fixes, of course. They always do. Um, yeah. But kind of the one that really stood out <laughs> for you was uh, there was an issue reading um, lossless compressed Nikon RAW files. And, yeah, uh, this one really kind of stood out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a real problem here. I always so when I look at any of bug fixes from any of the companies, if you guys just go to the very last bug fix, <laughs> all right, that's the important one. That's that they always they try do. to play down by putting they, it at the bottom of the they list. They play it down. You know? So it's like, oh, by the way, it catches on fire, but that's the last bug fix. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> bug fix. Yeah, we changed the color of this one element in the palette. Oh, okay, big deal. Yeah, yeah, but oh yeah, you're not being able to read the images. So this this bug <laughs> fix. So um, previously, some Im images would be um, read as random noise. Yeah, I mean, so what you're, is that? You know, yeah, random so you're, noise. It's like a staticky looking image. There's no image there. You know, basically, you have RGB dots, and, uh, and that's about it. So yeah. your your um, NEF, your raw file out of your Nikon from all of your D, like your D ones, all the D ones to the D twos, D two H, D two X. Uh, very popular D2XS and the D100 and whatnot. All those, they were all reading randomly. All of a sudden, your raw file would come in as just like a whole load of noise. So they fixed that, guys. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. a That's a serious bug fix that was crushed. So congratulations. That's wonderful. Um, but anyways, moving on. Uh, ACR 8.5. Adobe Camera Raw. Yes. Adobe Camera Raw. This is one of those issues that just piss me yeah, off. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. We, I, I listened um, to you bitch about this for a little while. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what they're thinking with this. I I kind of do. So what is going on here, guys, is they're introducing new things, okay? Yes. Um and as they introduce these new things, they are only giving these new things to people that are registered as Creative Cloud users. So right. what is paying happening, users. paying users, right. exactly. If right. you have CC, you get them. If you don't have CC, well, you know, you're SOL. And I have a problem with this because there's people out there that have purchased, for example, huge suites for thousands of dollars of the version six, which is still supported by Adobe. Yep. And they are not getting the benefit of these new items, these new things that are going on. Like, for example, right now, um, in the new um, uh, ACR software, your Adobe um, Camera Raw software, they've added what is called um, modify graduate, like any type of gradient. So you have either a radial gradient or a linear gradient. And what they allow you to do now is to add a mask to that gradient. So guys, I'm sure you've done this in the past. You have a model in front of you and you have a beach scene. Now, your sky is a little bit washed, so what are you going to do? You're going to go and take your linear grading, you go and go over the entire sky with it, and now grade like a nice like contrast, a little saturation the update, you know, a little vibrancy update, and make a nice, rich, beautiful sky. What happens, guys? Well, your model's head now has that gradient in there too, and now her head is extra blue and extra saturated. Right. Then you're going back and painting in to try. Okay, it's a whole lot. Of crap. Well, now all of a sudden they get they finally have made it made a way to take a brush and modify these gradients. So you right. can go in there, take a look at your gradient, and now go and kind of pencil them out. So now you have a beautiful sky, but your model doesn't have a blue face or extra saturated face. So that is really nice. I like it. They've needed this forever, and now they have it. But guess what? I can't have it. I can't have it. No, I'm not allowed. To. No, even you're though not I paid thousands and thousands and thousands over the last ten years, so I can't have it. All right, so okay, <laughs> I, I hear you. 
I do. And, and I'm sure everybody else out there is, is uh, kind of annoyed about this too. So devil's advocate, Adobe Camera Raw was always free. Um, you would get that with your Photoshop updates. You would get that, you know, you get your DNG converter and all those things. All those were free. So mm -hmm. what they're doing now is they're adding these features to a free program. But the only way you're going to get these features is if you are a Creative Cloud subscriber. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of annoying. I get it. But what's, you know, in, in what you're saying, Joe, is if you are a Creative Suite 6 owner, you bought it. It's the last standalone version that they have out there. Adobe is still supporting it. Um, they're doing updates for it and everything. This version of Adobe Camera Raw with the added feature is not available to you. So right. if you went out 30 days before Creative Cloud was announced and you purchased the full master suite of Creative, you know, of CS6 and no. spent a couple grand on it, now you're not getting these features. Yeah. You know, and, and yes, that, that would piss me off too. What they're doing, Trev, is they're using this as a case study, yeah. as like the Petri dish, and they're seeing how much mold grows, how many people bitch is yeah. what they're doing, okay? Yeah. So they're, they're making it, like you said, the free one where they're adding in this thing, right? Yeah. Well, in just a second, they're going to add it into Lightroom. And if you don't have the Lightroom version of the, the CC Lightroom and you just get, let's right. say, Lightroom 5.6, guess what? You're not going to have this feature. As of right now, if you do this manipulation in ACR um, 8.5 on the CC version, right? And you do a manipulation and you do this gradient and you do this, um, this changing of this gradient, this masking of the gradient, it will be represented in Lightroom 5.5, the one that yeah. I have. It will display... Yet, it will display. You exactly. just can't perform that operation yourself. Exactly. Yeah. You can't. You now, can't. I hear do you. This is a problem, it. and this is this is a way that Adobe, like you said, Adobe's trying to test the waters here. You know, see how many people bitch. Um, you know, they yep. did say when they introduced Creative Cloud that they are going to introduce features within Creative Cloud that are only available to Creative Cloud subscribers in standalone yep. CS suite owners won't get and obviously it's business i mean it's just like when you when you download the free version of an app and they try and upsell you to the paid version i mean their software exactly. developers are trying to make money off their software so they're eventually they're going to try and move everybody into creative cloud because they're going to make a ton of money there yeah. um you know rather than the guys sitting on you know a creative suite for you know four or five years you know exactly um, exactly so i mean all right guys sum up Adobe has done some really great things um, recently, yep. which in the past we've been kind of complaining about has been mediocrity, okay? They've really stepped up their game and their keynote is does represent that. So if you haven't seen their keynote, you might want to go, yeah, go and watch, watch it, it on it's YouTube only two hours or whatnot. Long. Exactly, or watch it on their site. It's only two hours long. You know, <laughs> grab, grab a ho-ho and like a, a coffee or something. But honestly, they've really done a lot. But... As far as the CC thing and this Petri dish that they've kind of put out there, it really, it does kind of put a sour taste in my mouth because yeah. they really need to kind of, if you're going to support a package and someone has purchased that package, you need to support them until the time at which you say that package is no longer supported. At right. that point, right. you want to just let them go and say, sorry, go ahead and up, up, you know, update to the latest and greatest. That's fine. But as long as you're still supporting a package, anything that you do for the next person needs to be done for the previous person or at least the person that is still being supported. Um, if not, it makes you look like an idiot, like just money hungry. You know, it's so we're going to see what kind of blowback that. they get. And I have a feeling yeah. as soon as they this, right now, Pete, this is under radar. OK, because it's for the free, it's this, that or whatever. As soon as this goes into um, as soon as they apply it to uh, as soon as they apply it to one of the packages that are paid, um, it, it's going to be crazy. Oh, I yeah. really think yeah. they're going to yeah. get all hell to break loose. Yeah. 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 Now, that's the thing. I mean, if you know, you watch the keynote, we got excited about it and it feels like, you know, wow, they took four steps forward, you know, and then they do something like this. This yeah. news comes out. You kind of get some rumblings on the Internet and it's like they take another two steps back. You yeah. know, as far as customer service goes and customers, you know, care. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. Like, like customer caring. 
you know, like yeah. caring about your customers. So. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, you found some Anyways, free photo apps you wanted yeah, to. Uh, always, always love to give you guys some free stuff. So there's two, two that I found that I really, really like that you can download that used to be three, four, five bucks, whatever they are. But anyways, these two are free and they're free as of right now. Number one is called Photo Transfer um, Wi-Fi. I've used this in the past. Um, it's definitely better than it used to be. It, they've really done some advancements. And what it does is it allows you to transfer um, images and video from your iDevice to another iDevice or to your Mac or PC and just easily right through Wi-Fi. So that really is nice. And you don't have to play with any type of um, you software don't have to sync to with kind of, iTunes or anything. Yeah, it's just, it's just a headache, right? Yeah, so you can yeah. do it right from your phone or right from your iPad. You can actually just swipe and just drop a picture from one iDevice to another iDevice or from your iDevice over to your computer just by simply swiping. Mm -hmm. Originally, you were always only able to do like one at a time. Now you can select entire libraries or you can select a selection of images and just drag and drop them to the specific device or folder. So nice. that's really, really cool. You like can it. take a look at the show notes. And uh, like I said, it's called Photo Transfer Wi-Fi. And we'll have a link uh, in the show notes directly there. Or you can just type it in there. And finally, it's um, Impressionism. I I am a artist. Um, that was my training. I went to the Art Institute. Um and this is quite a couple of years ago. Anyways, we won't say how many. <laughs> anyway, so I am an artist at, at heart. And um, they have uh, this really cool app that gives you access to 200 paintings from 14 masters to look through and zoom in on and copy and paste and use in, um, the, let's say, your Facebook or whatnot. And uh, it's really neat. So instead of playing a game, maybe jump in here and show your kids these 200 amazing great works of art and what's really cool is you can zoom in you can actually yeah. see these images better than if you were sitting at the gallery someplace sure you know in a museum so it's really interesting it's really good you got van gogh renoir monet you have a lot of the major major players way back in the day that are just amazing amazing artists and to look at the work and to see those colors and to see the brush strokes on how it was laid down because you can get in so tight it's just amazing. It's great. Yeah, it sounds cool. So it's an impre It's called Impressionism HD. Yep. So you can Definitely. throw the URL in there or you can just type that in and go and take a look. Cool. So moving on, this is one of your uh, probably favorite things. I got um, really excited about this. Yeah. <laughs> I know I, you I, love I know. this I'm, stuff. I'm, I'm a geek. You know, I love techie yeah. stuff. I love technology and stuff. And I uh, came across this Kickstarter. Um, you know, we, we do these Kickstarters, you know, it seems like every week. Um, yeah. But this one is called um, Air Dog. Yeah. Um, it's the worst, it's the world's, sorry, the world's yeah. first auto follow action sports drone. Yeah. Okay. So it's a mouthful, it. Trevor. Mouthful. Yeah, it is, especially when I get dry mouth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a quadcopter that yeah. has a GoPro on the front of it on a gimbal head. So yeah. it's, it's, it's stabilized, it moves, you know, it's real smooth. Um, but you have a device that you wear on your wrist or, or you can even attach it to your helmet or something like that. It's sort of like doing extreme sports and stuff. Yeah. Basically you hit the takeoff button, the, the quadcopter takes off and then you start your thing, whether you're mountain biking, you're riding a motorcycle, you're doing flips, you're surfing, whatever you're doing. And the quadcopter will follow you at whatever height and distance you preset it for. And yeah. the camera being on the gimbal will always point at the device on your wrist. Right. Really, really cool. Um, yeah. I just, the video is awesome. You know, yeah. you guys got to, we'll have a link in the show notes. You got to go over and check out this video. They already surpassed their goal of, uh, you know, they, what they were uh, uh, putting it out there for. I think it was like 200K. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a bunch. They, uh, it's really, really cool. The one thing to note: the wrist um, device that you wear it looks a little large and awkward, um, yeah. but that's a prototype. It's a working prototype. The final production is going to be like two times smaller. They said so. It could be kind of like a big watch at that point. Yeah. So don't don't forget here, guys. It doesn't have to be you that's wearing this thing. You could very easily um, take this trans transmitter transponder or whatever it is and throw it inside of a car and yeah. now have all have all, everything going on with this car tracked 
Yep. So what a great, great thing to do for like a commercial um, or for just like like you said, you could be mountain biking, you could be surfing, you could be doing anything, but you doesn't it doesn't mean that you have to actually have this on you. It could be something else. So maybe you stick this device into your um, RC car and go and have that flying around yeah. town or whatever. And now you have your copter. So everything, yeah, <laughs> everything yeah. is autonomous almost. You know, everything is RC. And now you have your thing flying down the street and the helicopter is flying after it you know yeah, uh, taking yeah. taking yeah, shots well, that's of it. it i mean the these guys developed it because they're all extreme sports enthusiasts right um so they wanted something that worked like this that would follow them without the need for somebody operating the helicopter standing on a beach while they're out surfing or something right. but from a photography standpoint a, a video standpoint even for sure. professional purposes um if you're a photographer down on the ground and you want to capture something you know, either stills or video from one angle, you can have the quadcopter in the air doing its own thing without having to have a separate operator to control it. So, yeah. So more, really, more, yeah, more over on that, on that whole angle thing that you just said, which what's kind of interesting is not only um, can you adjust the height at which um, this unit is staying above uh, whatever it's tracking, but also the angle in which it is actually shooting um, it at so sure. which kind of neat is let's say you're you're doing this million dollar home right and you're on the beach you could very easily fly this this copter over the house and now from from uh the device go and change the location do like a 360 degree pan around the top of this house land the damn thing and now you have this absolutely beautiful 360 of this million dollar house from overhead. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you beat that? I mean, that's just amazing. And you yeah. didn't have to fly it. It actually did it for you. Yeah. Um, takeoffs so, and landings are all automated. So it's yeah. not like you have to really know how to fly a quadcopter in order to make this thing exactly. work. Um, right. Really, really cool. Definitely check out the video. It's in prototype right now. They're, they're looking to launch it later. You know, they've got enough money. They met their goal. So it looks like this should, in theory, fly. <laughs> yeah, it will. <laughs> literally yes so all right all let's right. get out yeah we got to get out of here we're running long today we're making up for uh being a little late i guess so uh yeah so joe if people want to connect with you outside of the show what's the best way for them to reach you you can find me on twitter and that's at joseph christina and that's christina without an h great and you can connect with me on twitter it's at trevor Carr. So, all right, everybody, we are out of here for yet another week you can get all the show notes from this episode by visiting digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash 157. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. And we will see you next week. You've been watching the Digital Photography Cafe show with Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina. Subscribe to our YouTube channel with any compatible device by visiting youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. Be sure to subscribe to our audio feed through iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox Music apps or through RSS. Visit digitalphotographycafe.com for show notes and to connect with your hosts.